Okay, there are people in the room that I recognise. There are people who I know really well. Uh, there are other people perhaps I've not met ever. So, um, good morning, welcome. Uh, my name is Paul Bedford. I run a business called Retention Guru. It's just Retention Guru. I don't put the in front of it. It's not the Twitter or the Facebook or the YouTube. Um, I actually stole the name Retention Guru from a friend of mine, Pete Cohen, who had a business called Weight Loss Guru. And I thought, if he's arrogant enough to call himself the Weight Loss Guru, I'm going to give it a go and see what happens. And um, I let you decide whether you do understand the topic and the content of the sessions. So the business is called the Retention Guru. I don't go, I'm the Retention Guru. Uh, even I'm not that. Um, I am on social media, and I've been posting this morning, and if you wish to post, that's fine. Um, and if you want to follow up with me, now, we mentioned during Leon's session, Leon did that quadrant or matrix about, are you a fashionista or are you a you know, leader in digital? Leon presented at an event that I host, and we recorded it. So we've got a high-definition, multi-camera, one-and-a-half-hour version of him actually leading that session. So, as we said, if you, we'll send you a copy of that or act, give you access to that. And I think Leah will give you the, the slides and you can work it out for yourself. Um, if you want my slides or my presentation, just email me. I am videoing, so you can actually have a video of this session as well. So you can sit back and relax a little bit. Thank you to Life Fitness for inviting me again. Life Fitness have been a really strong supporter of the work that I do, particularly around the research uh, elements that I do. And um, you know they give me opportunities to speak, and I provide them with information about what I'm seeing going on in the industry, things they need to think about. 150 presentations in more than 24 different countries. Um, I think for us, if we're doing kilometres, 70,000 air, air kilometres in eight weeks at the end of last year. I visited seven countries. That's probably basically twice around the world. Um, so I get to see the industry, not just from a UK perspective, but from a global perspective. Yeah, that's that. Publish a lot, and I prefer to put my writings in trade journals rather than academic journals, because none of you are going to sit down and read academic journals. In fact, even the academics only read the abstracts and the summaries. It's only the PhD students that actually read the whole articles. So if we've learned things, it needs to get out there. That's my thoughts. We've done reports for the UK fitness industry back in 2008, Fitness Industry Association. That original study was done on 279,000 members. So they're big studies. Then we did one, we followed up in 2012 with one on 342,000. We did one for the New Zealand fitness industry, looking at their retention. It's awful. It's absolutely pretty much the worst I've ever seen anywhere in the world. Um, I wouldn't go and open the club in New Zealand if I was you. And we did a couple of years ago now, um, sponsored by uh, Life Fitness, we did what was called the 1 million strong study. It was actually 1.47 million member records in that study over three years. But 1.4 million strong doesn't set out quite the ring to it that a million strong does. And there's a history of a million strong marches and things in America. Now if we look at the, the, the fitness market, we know the fitness market is expanding, it's going in different directions all the time. In a mature market like the UK market, you know, we started with a premium brand like the David Lloyds. Those who've been around long enough remember Pinnacle Fitness, a sporter, were all high-end brands. And over time, in the same as any other product, it, did, it moves across and becomes more accessible. And Fitness First were really the first mid-sector stroke low-cost operator. They were only low-cost because they were less expensive than being a member of the premium operators, and they made fitness affordable. In fact, that was their tagline for years, fitness first, affordable fitness. They were one of the first operators to introduce the option to pay per month for a 12-month agreement. Prior to that, most of you would have to put, put up the whole year's money in one payment, and then pay again the next year. And so they sort of democratized fitness, and since then it's gone in different directions and it keeps going. And I struggle now with perhaps some of the terminology. I was with an operator recently and they said, oh, um, we're a value operator. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, well, we, 
have all the infrastructure of an old style club, we have all the costs of an old style club, we try and deliver old style in terms of full service, but we want to charge a little bit of money. So their margins are very, very narrow because actually they haven't got a good infrastructure for charging low cost. To do low cost well, you have to be very strict and have very good systems. I don't think it's actually easy to run low cost businesses. I think people look at it and go, ah, it'd be really easy to do that. I think it's really tough because <clears throat> you have to be really strict and have really good systems to keep the operating costs low in order to run the business effectively. And then we've got things like you know, boot camps and stuff that's going on outside. Most of my focus, in fact, the majority of my focus is <coughs> on clubs and what we can do in clubs to keep people members of clubs for longer periods of time. Now, this is a multi-site operator in the UK, and just to give an example, when I did this study for them, they had 44 sites and 120,000 members. This was their worst performing club in terms of retention. This is months since joining. So begin the first month they joined and then for 34 months. What do you notice? It's a rhetorical question because we haven't got the time. What do you notice about that first graph? Paul, look how many people go in the first month. That's a disaster. This was their best performing club. So basically they were getting 70% of their members through to a renewal period. Here they were only getting 18% of their members through to a renewal period and losing 40% of them within the first two months. The interesting thing was, this had the best performing sales team in their business. But then they bloody needed it. <laughs> now the reason I show you both of these side by side is for this. When I'm looking at working with operators, and I'm looking with multi-site operators, I want to know what's going on in each of the sites. Because the strategy you put in here is not the strategy you put in here. Now the challenge is with you guys today is I don't know where your businesses are at compared to these graphs. So I'm going to give to you 10 things that we have seen have the biggest impact on member retention. And even if you just started doing this without knowing the shape of the graph, you would start to see some differences. So that was Portugal. We don't care about that. <laughs> different clients, different companies. My interest is massively on data, but also I trained in psychology. So I look at how people's behavior can be changed. I started as a gym instructor, became a personal trainer, fitness manager, general manager of public and private sector clubs. Trained people to be personal trainers for 14 years at the YMCA's. <laughs> stepped away to study academically but studied psychology. I wanted to understand people's behaviour, not the intricacies of the acting and massing filament fibrils and the way they interact in the muscular contraction. I knew that, but couldn't understand psychology. An example, active sterling. Um, <clears throat> single site operator, obviously in Scotland. It's been a trust for five years, they approached me, they said, what can we do? We spent we did some six months on a project. I had 3,000 members pretty much stable over that period of time. We went in, we did some of the types of things that both Christian and Leon have been talking about, like stop, look, what works, what stopped working, how do we change things, made things as simple as simple as possible so any member of staff team could explain what was going on in the business. We reduced overall cancellations and we grew the membership base from 3,000 to 7,200 in 18 months. And that was without a specific sales strategy. It was like, how do we hold on to the types of people that come to our club or our facility and what can we do more to do that? So let's have a look at what you can do. A couple of things that I need to be clear about for you. I talk about the business or membership in three phases. There's the join phase, <laughs> measuring people, how many people joined this week, this month. There's the period of time they stayed for, measured in months. And there's the period of time, or there's the activity of they leave, measured in people. For me, I never ever convert this into a percentage. In fact, I think, and in fact, I've said it quite frequently, if you're reporting your attrition as a percentage, you have no idea what's going on in your business. If I thought attrition was the thing to drive to improve your businesses, my business would be called Attrition Guru. 
Retention is the thing to think of about. Attrition, <coughs> retention you focus on, it will change attrition. They are linked, but they're not the opposite. The opposite of leaving is joining. The opposite of leaving is joining. Too many people in our industry think the opposite of leaving is how long they stay. And it's not, it's the, op it's the opposite of joining. So, simple illustration, thousand people join, they stay three months, thousand people quit. Thousand people join club two, they stay 12 months, a thousand people quit. Put your hand up if you want to be the owner of club one. Put your hand up if you prefer to be the owner of club two. It depends on their pain. It's your club. It's your club. Let's say they were paying £35 a month, they're all paying the same. If this is the important thing, length of stay. Because we also know, now I won't share it in the data, well I'll share it now, but it's not in the data. We can also now plot and show increments in secondary spend over time as people stay longer in your clubs. So the longer they stay a member within your clubs, actually the more money they spend every visit. It goes up over time. Top 10 factors, these 10. Have a quick look. Anything <coughs> not up there that you're surprised about? Anything not up there that you thought, oh, I thought that would affect retention? John? Staff. Well, staff are inherent in interactions, programming, and so you, you, can, you can run a business without staff. But so many of these are affected by having staff. Yeah. Price. Price. Price does affect it. It just does. The more expensive you are, the longer they stay. Equipment. <laughs> having the right equipment for your membership demographic is vital. <coughs> Just having more equipment or a broader range of equipment doesn't seem to be. We've not ever been able to attribute, if you buy this piece of equipment, they will stay longer. Quality. What do you mean by quality, Christian? Be more vague, mate. Well, I mean, so I was thinking about equipment, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, cleanliness, quality, the facility. Yeah, so the actual how the business is run. Yeah. It does, but it ha it's actually the, it's it's not one of the top ten. <coughs> Just like PT is not a top ten. Value for money. Difficult to measure value for money because there are a lot of people now paying twenty five pounds a class and think that's good value for money, and people who won't pay nineteen pounds a month from from membership. So that's really confusing. The, the market's really you know you look at a CrossFit gym. I'm going to show you some pictures this afternoon. I'm sure you've seen them. CrossFit gym in Manhattan in Union Square, $310 a month. Equinox, across the road, literally, probably the best operator in New York, best high-end operator in New York, $210 a month. When you look at actually what they've got in their gyms, CrossFit's got rubberized flooring, a Lico bar, some boxes, kettlebells, you go into Equinox, they've got a spa, a swimming pool, treadmills, <coughs> every resistance machine you could think of. They're less expensive than the CrossFit gym down the road. So it's confusing now because people will pay more for a for one-off class boutiques than they pay for a whole membership in some facilities. I had an interesting one the other day, and I'm not quite sure about this. I saw a stat, and, and Leon was saying some of the stats are confusing. <laughs> 45% of US members are now members of a boutique. I don't believe that. I don't think there's enough boutiques to facilitate 45% of the exercising population, gym exercising population of America being a member of a boutique. Let's have a look at these. Queuing. Is queuing a factor? Yeah, queuing's a factor. Having to queue or wait for equipment is a factor. However, it's interesting that if it's at six o'clock at night when your gym's going to be busy and people expect your, busy, your gym to be busy, they actually tolerate that better than if it's queuing in the middle of the afternoon when they expect it to be quiet. It's a bit like this morning, those of you who drove in this morning. You don't <coughs> want to queue in the traffic, but you know part of the process of travelling at that time of day is queuing in traffic. 
If it was a nice free ride in, you'd be fine with that. But actually it didn't stop you coming. You didn't go, I'm not going because I might have to sit in traffic. Some of you might have been thrown by the amount of traffic Nottingham actually has. But you're not worried about it. And actually when you start looking at it, when you break down the demographics, it's only a small proportion of the members that complain about queuing. It's not every member. The other interesting thing we've found, particularly when we've been doing research in the low cost operators, is there's a sense of, it's to do with social proof, but there's a sense of if the gym's busy, I've made the right decision. I want to go to a gym that's busy. I don't want to have to queue for ages to get on the bench or do my squat, but I want there to be other people there because it reassures me I've made the right decision. In the same way you walk past empty restaurants looking for busier ones. Mm -hmm. But if you get to one where they're actually queuing out the door, you go, mm, that's too much. So there's a balance to that. <coughs> If you removed all of the issues around queuing, about 5% of your cancellations would be avoided. So it has an effect, but it's not a massive effect. And what I'm interested in is, I'm not interested in measuring what equipment's being used, I'm interested in the pathways that the members are actually taking within the facilities. Because if I'm told, oh, this, this area of the gym is, is really frequently used, it's a, it's a real hot spot, that could be one person staying there for an hour or a hundred people staying there for a few minutes. I want to know what the people are doing rather than know what the machines are doing. Inductions should probably be higher up the list. Inductions have a massive impact on how long people stay. In fact, offering someone an induction can increase their length of stay for, for at least seven months beyond what your benchmark measure is now. Yet the problem is, most of the inductions our industry offers, or as traditionally <coughs> offered, are focused around doing what we want to do to cover our asses from an insurance perspective, and forcing everybody through the same thing. 2002, seven out of 10 people joining the health club had never been a member of a gym. 2012, seven out of 10 had been a member of a gym, and the vast majority had been a member of the gym they were rejoining. So the induction where you say, I'm going to show you around, I'm going to teach you the cardiovascular machines, the resistance machines, you know, maybe write you a program, is appropriate to a small proportion of your members. But if you're going to come in and you're going to use something like, I don't know, one of the synergy rigs or something, and you do functional training, of course you're not going to turn up to an induction that doesn't include the activities you're going to do. So the type of induction you have must directly relate to the type of what that member's trying to achieve where their knowledge and their experience sits. <coughs> when I did my PhD, I didn't look at, well this came out of um, some work my colleague Dr. Melvin Hillsden did, where he looked at visit frequency in the early months of membership and he identified that members who come once a week in the first four weeks stay 13 weeks longer than people who don't come once a week. <coughs> and so a lot of operators, decided to design multiple appointment gym inductions to force people to come four times in the first four weeks. David Lloyd did it. Edinburgh Leisure did it. I did it in the clubs I was running. Lots of operators did it. But what Melvin was saying was just about visiting. You've got to come in and visit. And what I saw was a lot of these inductions were designed around forcing people to um, had multiple point of gym inductions. In fact, at one point you had a 12 week induction, one appointment a week for 12 weeks. That's a lot of commitment. Yeah. Trying to make some, before you can really access a facility, you've got to jump through all of these hoops. So I looked at, could we change people's behavior? If we give them a standard one hour gym induction, and this was a randomised controlled trial, we give them some a, a, a standard gym induction and some a standard gym induction plus support on the gym floor in the first four weeks. You know, targeted support for that person. Could we improve it? We, we added seven months. Seven months of membership. The curves are the same shape. So we just delayed, and we've got the data for the three-year follow-up to that, and after about two years, they come together. But just remember this, from a business perspective, everything under the line is money. 
So the higher the lines are, the more income that is. From a member's perspective, if they stopped exercising, not if they've gone somewhere else, but if they've stopped exercising, the higher the line is, the more likely they are to have achieved their results. Because they're still exercising. If you're selling personal training, the more likely you are to sell PT. Some of the studies we've done recently show only 10% of people join by PT on joining. 60% of PT people buying personal training are doing it after month six. Yeah, most of the PTs I met go, who are the new joiners? I only want to talk to the new ones. Do you want to buy PT? I don't think about, actually it takes about six months for a member to fail, sorry to use that term, to cultivate someone who's going, do you know what, I need some help. Because no one joins believing they're going to fail, they join believing they're going to be successful. Did this with a low cost operator, just for those people who are new to exercise, compared to their members who are experienced exercisers. So we did the new exercise and gave them a one hour session of a gym induction. They stayed seven extra months compared to the same demographic that didn't get one. So I made it or perhaps more complex than it needs to be. One session with multiple follow up. They got the same effect just from getting someone to attend an induction. Marketing. Said this so many times. Older members stay longer than younger members. Always. In fact, if you had a separate group called student, they would quit faster than even the younger members. Average months of membership, we get about 15 months from the 16 to 24 year olds, but 22 months from the 55 plus. Here's a worrying thought though. Even when we did the study in America, 475 clubs, 1.47 million members, the proportion of people over the age of 55 still wasn't significant enough to have a group that said 56, or sorry, uh, 55 to 64. There's a real tail off. And in our industry, 35, you're old. 35, you're old. Sorry. <laughs> I'll leave by this door. I'm not getting out of that door. It's, like, it's a load of game. <laughs> Why is this? When we follow this up and we look at the demographics and, and the behaviours predominantly, we know that people over the age of 35 are more secure in their jobs, they're more secure in their accommodation, they tend to live in a location, their weekly work patterns become more habitual. I do this on a Monday, this on a Tuesday, this on a Wednesday. So when they find a time when they can fit exercise into their weekly calendar, if it sticks, it sticks. But people under the age of 35 are more transient, both in their work, their home, and in their weekly behaviours. The challenge is, these are harder to sell to. But once you've got them, the ones that moan will never leave, but they are much more loyal as members. In fact, I did a report called The Black Report where we spoke to a thousand people who'd been members of more than two gyms. Between them, they had six and a half thousand years of membership. That's mad, isn't it? Yeah, they've been exercising for six and a half years and joined two clubs for that to happen. There was a woman in it, and I used the quote all the time. She said, Thursday night is Zumba night. <laughs> Thursday night is Zumba night. My husband knows it's Zumba night, and he has to be home from work early to look after the kids and cook their tea. And if he's working away, he has to arrange childcare because Thursday night is Zumba night. <laughs> and it's like, it's in her diary. She doesn't want to miss it. And one of the things we found looking at group exercise and visit frequency and time of visit is that people who visit at the same day, same time, exercise for longer than people who visit on an ad hoc basis. So we're wondering now whether group, the effect of group exercise is actually the time, the set time and day effect, as opposed to the content. Because it seems that every class on a Monday night is busy, no matter what the content is. So is it, I've got time on a Monday night? We know clubs are always busy on a Monday because psychologically people are paying themselves back for their bizarre behaviours over the weekend. In fact, before Christian was involved in David Lloyd, Life Fitness sponsored a project where I spoke to 10,000 David Lloyd members. 
We went into clubs, 28 sites, and spoke to members on the gym floor to find out what they were doing and what they were thinking. If all members were over 35, 30% 30 of all your cancellations could be avoided. I love all the stuff that comes out. We've got to go to millennials. We've got to go after the millennials. Here's an interesting fact. Did you know today <clears throat> it's the greatest number of people over the age of 70 that have ever lived are alive today? It's a new world record today. Tomorrow will be a new world record. And it will be a new world record every day till 2032 when the population trend starts to decrease in young, in, uh, young, increase in younger people and decrease in older people. <coughs> Someone who successfully followed that trend, because they're the baby boomers, is Richard Branson. Pretty much every product or project he's ever done has followed the vast majority of the population. He's followed that wave, that age trend. Yet most of what we offer or promote or a lot, no, not most, a lot of what we offer and promote is actually offered to the millennials. Maybe because we get them, they join up easier. But actually they're a smaller market than the older market. Contracts. Oh, can I just ask? Yeah, of course can you can. Let me keep going, because I'm going to run out of time anyway. So, <laughs> sorry, mate. This was the US data. We've seen it the same everywhere we've done it. Not exactly the same, but the same shapes. People who sign up month by month by month don't stay as long as people who sign up to an agreed period of time longer than that. Even if it's a 12 month agreement and you don't enforce it, they stay longer than if you charge them month by month by month. I have seen one operator in the UK say, our month by month members stay longer than, our 12, than 12 month people. When I spoke to some of their operations people, they said, we haven't got a 12-month agreement. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. <coughs> but there are a number of reasons for this. Month by month by month, you actually get the option to cancel every month. You get that choice. It's a bit like playing Russian roulette. Imagine it's got 12 chambers. It's got stay or quit, two chambers. One's got a bullet in, one hasn't. Each month you spin, pull the trigger, stay or go, stay or go. You get to play it 12 times in a year. If you have an agreement or a contract that says you're going to pay for 12 months, you get to play once in a 12 month period. So actually we're giving people an opportunity to make a decision about our business more frequently. But even if we don't enforce those contracts, people who sign up to an agreed period of time stay longer. Always. And what we're seeing here in the States is, this pretty much replicates this white line, which is month by month by month, the low cost operators and the independents, the small businesses competing against one another. The dark orange line are the bigger health club chains, the brands that people know and recognize. Now what we notice <coughs> is that this group of people tend to be more savvy as exercisers they're the ones who know they're going to be exercising for 12 months, so don't mind signing up for 12 months because they get a deal. On average, month by month in the US, they get 15 months of membership. Those who sign up for a 12-month agreement and then it rolls, so they're still paying each month, but it rolls, they get more than 36 months of membership. Just out of interest, show of hands, who here has an option <coughs> for a 12-month agreement? Okay. Who here only has 12-month agreements? That's fine. If you don't have 12-month agreements, you're not even giving people the choice. I worked with a number of low cost operators and I said to their board, they said, what's the first thing you do? I said, I'd give people the choice of signing up for 12 months. I said, well, that's not how we built our business. I said, well, I'm not saying take this away. I said, you can do all your advertising and marketing you like around it. We do month by month by month. But when they get to your website, why don't you have a thing that says, if you'd like to, instead of paying 
180 pounds for the year, uh, for, but uh, uh, 18 pounds a month, you could pay 180 pounds for the year in a one-off payment. There'd still be a little bit of, I'll have that. So I'd have both. Oh, and we've seen the, well, I'll show you on this. If you have a three month, they quit after three months. If you have a six month, they quit after six months. Very few people join your facilities with the mindset of I only want to be a member for a month. In fact, if you ask the right questions when they do join, they go, oh, can I quit after I go, yeah, but how long were you thinking of being an exercise at all? Well, the rest of my life. Well, why would you even consider that then? You're going to get a better deal on this. That's the salesperson's job. One month, 5% made it to 12 months. Throughout four months, 10% made it. Those who signed up to 12 month agreement, 80% made it to the end of the first year. That's not the same as saying they still visited. We need other data for that. Or for some operators, we've got that. So we have two curves. We have the, this is near, paying, visiting. And you want the visit data, you need to know when they stop visiting, because if they've stopped visiting, trying to resell this group, it's going to be hard. So your renewal rates on the 12 month period will be much tougher. <coughs> Group training. If all members did some group training, some, one class a month, about 18%, you could avoid about 18% of your cancellations. Now we do know this, men and women, there's no difference in retention in men and women. You've never seen it in over 3,000 facilities we've analysed all over the world. What people do in their clubs differs. There is a propensity for women to do more group activity and more men to do individual activity, and there's an overlap. <coughs> but if you could get some people to do more or a group activity class once a month, you'd avoid some of your cancellations. Men like group activity where they can compete and compare. <laughs> <laughs> I did more press-ups, I did more squat thrusts. They'll go to body pump because they can compare the weight of the person next to them and go, I need a little bit more on this. Who is here who is here to talk body pump? It's alright if you had. You see the blokes when they come into body pump and they load up the bars and they watch the women going, yeah, yeah, yeah watch this, watch this. Ten minutes in they're like screaming and unloading the bars. Men love those compete and compare environments. Women go are less focused on that, they're more focused on having a positive experience and the whole group getting a good workout. Now men don't tend to do as much yoga or Pilates, apart from me and Rob Jones, um, because we can't go, well my breathing's better than yours. <coughs> Check out my pelvic floor contraction. You can, but I won't let you. <laughs> you know, we can't compete and compare. So having someone do some group type of activity will be beneficial. Pushing them into group won't work. Who here, when they work out, likes to work out on their own? I want to be around other people, but I want to do my own thing. In fact, when I go mountain biking with my friends, there's two or three friends we go with, and when other people say, well, I'll come for a ride with you, I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> We're not going this weekend. Because <laughs> it's not how I want to, I want to form my own friendships, I don't want friendships forced upon me. Social. Members who report frequent interactions with fitness staff are also much more likely to have made a new, report having made a new friend. Yeah. <laughs> that can be quite sad though. <laughs> my sister once, someone said to her one time, she's worked in the industry for longer than I have, said to her, what do you do? She said, I'm a friend to sad people. <laughs> they went, what's that? She went, I'm a personal trainer. <laughs> Interaction's really vital, that's why it's going to be so high up the list. But that sense of belonging, I had an issue with an operator this week, not a big issue, I've just done a proposal for them, they came back to me and they said, oh, can you turn, change the term member in the proposal to customer, because we need to present that to our board, and they don't like the term customer, they don't like the term member feels too restrictive. I said, you do realise the term customer means transactional and the term member means relationship. And they were like, 
I said, I'll change it because I want the work. <laughs> but you need to understand that those words have real power and real differentiated meaning. Goals. You need to be able to help people achieve their goals. Now what we tend to do as an industry is we tend to focus on the outcome. Lose three kilos, run a marathon, bench 100k, whatever. The big outcome. And what we tend to do in the way we've trained a lot of our fitness staff is we go deep into the smart, specific, measurable, uh, achievable, realistic time frame. In real detail, really quickly, I can tell you this. No one wants a gym membership. They don't want a gym membership. They want the results of a gym <coughs> membership. And in fact, what they really want is what they think the results of a gym membership are going to do for them. So here's my scenario. Why do I want a gym membership? Because I want to be more attractive to a wider range of people. <laughs> I want to be able to look good. I want someone to find me attractive that my friends would be envious of. So that when I walk out and go, have you met? My friends are like, how did he do that? That's what I want from a gym membership. They're the drivers of behaviour. What we focus on is the activities they need to do it. And sometimes these are 3, 6, 12, 18 months away. So what we need to do is focus on what's called a superordinate goal. Those behaviours. What, what's driving you? What's motivating you to turn up? You can identify this in four questions. And three of them are the same. Question. What will that do for you? Once you've identified that, then you plan the programme. But now you know what to say to the person to motivate them every time they come in. Because it's, have you lost any weight yet? Isn't it? So we know that progress towards a goal is really important. But we focus so far on the future, we forget learning to use the equipment could be a goal. Turning up today could be a goal in the early stages for new exercises. It's not the same for the experienced exercises. They're going to turn up anyway, they're sadly. In different formats, people say this all the time, you can turn the lights off, throw water over them. They still turn up and train. Swimmers, <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you're getting out of your car and they're opening the door for you. Because you're going in to open the building up. Just out of interest to you, Swimmers have the highest retention of any membership type. Highest retention of any membership type we've ever seen. We see it frequently. Problem is, there aren't enough to make a business from it. <laughs> For each goal that a member reported making progress on, the risk of them cancelling next month fell by 10%. So you have to have all these intermediary goals. You have to have behavioural goals, not just fitness outcome goals. <clears throat> Programming. This might sound really obvious. The exercise content must be directly related to the member's goal. And that the member can understand what the benefits are of doing that exercise in relationship to that goal. So, sorry to pick on me. I think I'm well placed to do it. There are a number of people that join our clubs, some men. And when they come in, we ask them, why are you joining? We say, get fit, tone up. What they mean is... Now, if we give them a well-balanced program that has a warm-up, maybe a pre-stretch, some cardiovascular, some resistance, maybe a few free weight exercises or functional exercises, and some cool down and a stretch, it's well-balanced, it's everything it needs to be to hit all of the industry standards for programming against the occupational standards. We take them through it. Which the bits they do? What bits of that program do they actually do? Arms and chest. They don't warm up, they don't stretch. They avoid the cardio because they think it will make them shrink, <laughs> like the Wicked Witch of the West. Oh, I'm shrinking, I'm shrinking. <laughs> they spend extra time doing chest and arms. Don't train legs. And then they leave to do their head. 
because no one's ever explained to them that actually a muscle, in order to recover effectively, needs to be returned to its resting length before the recovery process starts. So they walk out of the gym with their arms not being able to straighten. They're like that for two or three days, but they come back into the gym to do more bicep curls. And actually, they haven't fully recovered from the last workout. But they're not going to stretch. Because well, how does stretching relate to me having big muscles that girls find attractive and intimidate other men? In fact, to be fair, if you look at some gym floor layouts, you see the whole gym floor layout, and they go, and stretching is really important. That's why we put a mat in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> they must be able to see the relationship. If I do this exercise, it leads to that outcome. So sometimes that's an educational thing. Also, the issue of, met of staff writing the programs they want to write as opposed to the program that the client needs or the client wants. They've been on a kettlebell training course this weekend. So now this week, everybody's going to get kettlebells in some format in their, right, in their program. Rather than approaching the people who've been a member six months and asking them how the training's going, would you like me to show you something? Let's start with the new people. Start with the experience of the people who are already using the gym. Do you want me to expand your repertoire of exercises? I went on a kettlebell training course this weekend. I'd like to practice teaching. Would you, would you then teach you two or three exercises for the next five minutes? So expand that repertoire. They can't see that. They don't, they don't, they don't mad. And they're not going to come back for a follow-up, are they? How many, how many facilities are there? You go, we're going to do a gym induction, and in eight weeks' time, we're going to follow up and see how you're getting on. And if they're not doing the program you gave them in the first place, they're not going to come back for a follow-up to go, do you know what? Didn't do your program. Just picked on that bloke over there or this woman, and she's doing chins, and she's got the arms I want, so I've included chins in my program. So we lose credibility with our customers when we don't understand what they want and what they need. Progress must be consistent. You can improve your aerobic fitness in about six weeks. You'll see a change in your resting heart rate and your exercising heart rate and your breathing. <coughs> Muscular endurance takes about the same time to see a significant improvement. Muscular strength, you'll see an improvement in the first six weeks, but most of that will be neurological. A strength in the neurological pathways in order to recruit the muscle fibres to lift the weight. So the weight stack goes up and up and up and up for the first six weeks. And you're going, like this, by Christmas, I'm going to be lifting the whole, the whole gym. <laughs> After about six weeks, neurological pathways are set. Now the muscle fibres and the filaments start to grow. Progress slows down, but that's when you actually see an increase in muscle size. If you told someone that and what to expect, they're more likely to believe you in six weeks' time when you say to them, have you noticed it's slowing down? Right, now what we need to do is this. Rather than going, oh, it's, I'm failing. I was doing so well and now it's all tapered off. The one that always amazes me is flexibility. You improve someone's flexibility now, today, in this session. Let me improve your flexibility. The reason we inflect you, you can give more manual reasons for doing it. Visit frequency, really important, as a progression. You're coming more frequently. As bizarre as it might sound, for me, I set myself for mountain biking, which is my preferred activity at the weekends, one a week. Because with all the travelling and lecturing and training I do, or you know, teaching I do, it's realistic for me to do just one mountain bike session a week. But it's in my diary now, it's a bit like Zumba. <laughs> And for me, it's a Saturday now. It's always been a Saturday, and it's some time on a Saturday. But it's, at least then I'm doing 52 workouts a year. And then I add to it in other ways during the rest of the week. So sometimes the idea of them coming three times a week. How many of you sometimes struggle with exercising three times a week? Yeah, we, they have to build up to three times a week. Come once a week, build up to three times a week. As you get more confident in the environment, more competent in the environment, add more sessions. Progress must be consistent in the exercise as well. If all low progress members were spoken to, you'd avoid 10% of your cancellations. Because <coughs> you won't know they're low progress members unless you go and talk to them. 
I'm not really getting the results I was looking for. Number two, interactions. <clears throat> so this is where staff come in. And I talk about interactions as being human to human contact, whereas a digital to human contact, I would call an engagement. So any way you can have in, you engage with somebody in your business, it could be through your <coughs> website, it could be through SMS or emails. For me, that's engagement. Interaction is when there's a person to person. That's how I differentiate. I know people do it different ways. That's how I do it. Members who report not being spoken to by either reception or fitness staff are more than twice as likely to cancel as members who are always spoken to. Now, I was recently in one of the David Lloyds. I'm sorry, Christian, you seem to be the focus of the, every presentation today. I was in one of the David Lloyds recently. Nice club. Walked in. They have an automatic process. If you have your membership card, you can swipe and enter. <coughs> And if you're not a member, and I'm not, I have to go to reception. Now, the advantage of having the automatic is the self-service part of it. If I'm a member, I know what I'm doing. <coughs> I can walk through, I can get in, I can get going. The disadvantage is, sometimes that means I don't get an interaction from front of house. In fact, I could possibly go in, train, ch uh, change, train, work out, shower, change, leave, and never be spoken to. What it does do, though, is it does free up the reception team to provide interactions, if necessary, just by saying, hello, good morning, how are you? <coughs> because they have less time that they're having to deal with every single person that's coming up to the reception desk. <coughs> what is now Third Space Canary Wharf, which used to be the Reebok Club, they've looked at their reception team and the tasks of their reception team, and they said, we have got, we, they do 3,500 visits a day in very constrained periods, before work, lunchtime, after work. They've made their reception basically a group of people that can deal with difficulties, signpost new members <coughs> of people who want to join to the sales team, and stand there and say hello and goodbye to anyone who walks in and out of the building. They've kept it really, really simple. And they said, oh, if there's a, if there's a query that needs to be dealt with, they go, hang on, we'll get someone to deal with that for you. They hand them over. They're back on reception. I have a standing thing there. They have a restaurant there. If you ever go into that club and reception don't smile and say hello to you when you arrive, you can get a coffee on me and you can go into the restaurant and go, I, you've got to go to the reception first, though. You can't just go to the restaurant. I want a coffee. Paul's paying. I say, I'll pay for your coffee. It's never happened in 12 years. They're drilled. They know what they're supposed to do. Now, interestingly enough, Members don't value the interaction at reception as highly as they value it by the actual staff that are supposed to be looking after them where they've gone to be active. So if it's in a group exercise class, if the group exercise teacher looks at class and says, morning, welcome, how are we? They value that more highly than the receptionist going, morning. Because this is the place where they do their activity. If a gym instructor says, good morning, how are you? Do you need to from me? They value that more highly than reception. They even value your back office staff <laughs> saying hello, good morning, how are you more highly than reception. If they're walking through the building and I see one of the general managers or the manager look at it, they go, hi, how are you? They're like, oh, I'm fine, thanks. They value that more highly than reception. You know why? Because their reception is supposed to speak to you. It's called reception. You're receiving me. They also have a high value when people leave. So when people are leaving the facility, <coughs> simple statement, when are you in next? Marlon, when are you in the club next? First thing he does is he goes straight into his head and goes, yeah, when am I in next? He starts to make a mental booking of when he's coming in next. But if he can't come next, I say, are you in again at the weekend? He goes, no, no, I'm busy at the weekend. And actually, I'm away next week, but I'll be in the week after. By him verbalising that, that actually affects his behaviour. So rather than just saying to him, Marlon, bye, have a good weekend, it's Marlon, when are you in next? He commits to it, and then I say to him, have a good weekend. And there are variations on that that you can do. If both reception and fitness staff always spoke to all members, we've estimated 44% of your cancellations could be avoided. 
I've walked into facilities and I still walk into them every week where I walk in and reception do this. <laughs> or they're behind the desk. <laughs> their heads are down. And gym staff or fitness staff or PTs that won't engage. <laughs> I watched one last week, I had some clients over from um, Estonia and we were going around London in some clubs. One of the PTs just stood in the corner of this huge facility. <laughs> it's like the exercise police, it was like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're going to drive engagement and make people feel welcome and belonging. I use this slide in every presentation I do. If you've ever seen me speak, you've seen this presentation. Somehow I'm going to squeeze it into this afternoon's one. It has nothing to do with it. <laughs> study we did on 78,000 people. <clears throat> did this first. We, asked the pro we, we worked out the probability of someone coming and being a member next month if they were spoken to this month. So if I spoke to them in February, the chances that I did it just once, the chances of them still being a member in March, I think, 20% more likely. If I spoke to them two to three times in February, chances of them still being a member in March, 50% more likely. If I spoke to them four times in February, chances of being in the gym and still being a member in March, 80% more likely. That is a person-to-person -person interaction that requires four visits. It's not Steve coming in and me saying to Steve, having four conversations with him in one visit. <coughs> it's four visits, he's engaged with each of those four visits. If it comes more, that's great. But they don't have to be long conversations. There are 15 types of conversation you can have with people. <coughs> 15 different types. And you can't have all 15 types until you've built rapport with somebody. The types of conversations I can have with Christian, we've met today for the first time, are different compared to perhaps what conversations we might be having later this year or in two years or just because of how the relationship develops. He might not even be talking to me after this presentation. I don't know. <laughs> but I've had fitness instructors say, oh, if I talk to members, they leave. And I said, well, I can solve that. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? I said, I'll sack you. <laughs> <coughs> People don't want to be interrupted. They want to be engaged with, they want to be interacted with, but they don't want to be interrupted. So timing of interactions is really, really important. The level of interaction is really, really important. If you were charging 35 pounds, dollars, euros, it was all the same thing now. You had a thousand members paying 35 dollars a month, this was a study we did, 16 clubs, 8 in this group, 8 in that group, we randomised the clubs. One day of training on interaction, how to start and maintain conversations appropriately. The difference in income over 12 months is £227,000. Leon. Five minutes. Cheers, mate. <laughs> I did ask him to do that, and then I thought he was asking for a question. I like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't well, ask. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I know I did. I'm just, yeah, I'm just thinking again, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> That's ridiculous. How many of you have got stuff? Don't get the idea that low cost operators don't have staff. They might not have many employed staff. But I work with a gym group and there's usually 10 to 14 personal trainers in that facility. When we can finally get about nine of them on board, I don't expect to get the rest of them. When we get about nine of them on board, prepared to talk and interact with the members, well, then the moment they go, well, if you want to talk to me, I'm the person trying to cost you £35 an hour. At least £35, I'm 30. I'll do it for 20. It all becomes transactional, not relationship driven. That's massive impact. I think 
Is, An is it Angela from Kiel? Who's from University? Is here? I know there's a couple. Is, is it Angela that's at Kiel? It's Angela that's at Kiel University. Angela at Kiel University had 500 people <laughs> using her fit sports and fitness facility. She came to a presentation that I did a number of years ago. She went back to her team. She got them saying to people, when are you in next? She said over the years, she said they've done nothing to the team, nothing to the equipment. There are two and a half thousand users now. Because that's the people feel engaged with the business. They want to belong. They want to fit in. Those who had no interaction cancelled at a rate. This is people. 123 people per thousand members per month and stay 4.95 months. Those who had at least one interaction, look, watch this. One interaction over the 12 month period, not one interaction every time they visited, <coughs> could remember having one interaction in the 12 month period. Quit a rate of 40 per thousand per month and stayed 14 and a half months. If your start, if your members cannot remember being interacted with, even when the start, but now we talk to everybody, then the interactions are of no value. The interactions must have value. Do they need to be personal interactions or that, that happens over time. So initially, it's you almost have to in a lot of clubs, you have to train members to get used to being spoken to. Because you know, when we've done some studies, I've worked with my colleague Keith, and he'll stand there at the club reception, and people are walking in and go, morning, how are you, morning, and they go... <laughs> <laughs> and then when I go around and start going, can we just, were you spoken to today? They went, yeah. Well, when was the last time you were spoken to? Don't remember. So it starts off as just an interaction at a very superficial level. It's not superficial in content, but superficial level, and over time it grows. Now some will turn around and go, oh, I'm fine, thank you. Actually, and they'll go, they'll squeeze these 15 into like two minutes. Others will never talk to you. 5% of your members are miserable bastards. They don't talk to themselves or anybody else. There's nothing to do with you, they just don't. But it starts at a superficial level and builds over time. That's why it has to be consistent. What happens is often staff will go, oh, I said hello to Neil, he didn't respond, or he went, oh, morning. Well, I won't go talk to you again. Because they expect it to go from not knowing you to, you know, best friend in the world, like that. And it doesn't happen like that. None of our relationships happen like that. So that wouldn't happen in the gym. Okay, number one, visits. Most important thing. If they don't turn up, it doesn't matter what business you got, what product you got. They've made a judgment, haven't they? I've got better things to do with my time. I've got other places to be. Visits are the number one predictor of membership retention. <laughs> as soon as visit frequency starts to drop, likelihood of cancelling, or probability of cancelling, just goes through the roof. So you need to be accurately able to predict if that visit frequency pattern of this person is their normal pattern. And you have to be able to do it now really effectively at the individual level, not at an aggregated or standard every person who comes in <laughs> needs to visit four times a month. Because they may not visit four times a month as their normal pattern. You need to learn their pattern and you can do that if you've got historical data as well. Average visit frequency from 36,000 uh, members we were looking at, 53% come less than once per week when measured monthly. <laughs> so they're not getting five workouts in five weeks of a month. So they're coming less than that. You've only got 20% coming once a week. So there's a high proportion of people that come quite frequently and we're actually wondering now is, if we talk to the people who come all the time, is that the reason they come all the time? Is it cyclical though? They come all the time so we talk to them, or we talk to them so they come all the time. Really important, time to first visit from joining. We were able to look at a lot of data of how long it takes people to get started once they've joined. You really need to get it happening within the first two weeks. If it's longer than that, you're going to lose loads. 
it's more challenging for university environments and for new club openings. Because universities have two new years a year, October and January. In October, a facility can get 10,000 new members. Doing one-to-one -one inductions won't work in that environment. You have to do it, you have to do it in a different format. New club openings, you need to manage new club openings. Otherwise, if there's too many people in the club on the first week, actually get high, high rate of cancellation because it's too, too busy. You've got to get the start within two weeks, ideally one week. But look, we've got, in this, we had 15% weren't getting it in the first four weeks. It's a bit get like getting late to a TV show that all your friends are into. You know, well, I've missed the first two. I don't know if I'll actually bother watching that or I'll wait till it's on box set. Compared to one visit a week, if they come twice a week, they stay seven months. If they are seven months longer, two to three visits, you get an extra 19 months. Three or more visits, you get them 28 months. Now, which of these, they have to listen carefully, which of these is more, do you think, more difficult to achieve? Get them to turn up once for an induction, or get them to turn up multiple times in a week over a period of time. Induction or multiple visits. I would argue it's easier to get them to turn up for the induction, because the induction, remember, can give you seven months. <coughs> so actually doing the right induction and funneling them into the right induction with the right type of content will have a really high value on your business if that's appropriate. But you want to be driving visit frequency. That's why my question to Marlon is, when are you in next? My number one role and responsibility in the business is the next visit. Can I get you to make another visit? Ideally within the next seven days. One of the highest periods of dropout is after the school holidays. If you track it, they were working out, they were working out, the kids had two weeks off for half term or a week off for half term, life gets disturbed, that place in the week where you did exercise can't be taken, and then it drops off. Students, term times, exam times, you can see the patterns all the time. So I focus on what I call, if I say in the top three, visit interaction programming. Retention is about VIPs. Visits, interactions, and programming. They all interrelate. But you can't interact with them if they don't turn up. You can engage with them. What you have to be careful though with digital communications is you could actually piss off more people and a bigger number of them more quickly than if you actually didn't send anything. So there was a study done back, I think it was 2008, where it was looking at people who turned up in the gym, who weren't spoken to, but got an email saying congratulations for coming today, were more upset. <laughs> they said, well, if you knew I was here, why didn't you speak to me? Than people who weren't spoken to. <coughs> so you have to be careful. Now, 2008 is actually a long time ago now. We probably need to replicate that. Because certain people don't seem to mind being tagged on Facebook that they turned up to work out. But they don't have to do it. Someone do, it does it automatically for them. In summary, a number of factors, in fact all of these factors, plus more, all affect retention. Some of these are going to be more straightforward for you to deliver. If you're a business and you're in an area where it's younger members, it's always going to be harder for retention than if you're in an area where there's older members. But sales will be more challenging. We can now model all of this in real time. We are able to take data. In fact, some of the stuff we've been doing with a US operator, we can actually tell on joining the week in which someone's likely to buy personal training after they've joined, and when they're likely to quit if they don't. But you have to have a lot of data feeds in to do that. Um, thank you. I can see it's hovering. <laughs> Two slides. <laughs> <laughs> <Really? laughs> I was told I was allowed to put that up. Oh, you do it. I just, I literally just made it. John's sitting next to me, I'm typing it out. 18th of May, Manchester, we will be running the third retention venture. It's a one day event where I have speakers from all over the world come in and talk about various aspects of retention. I know some of you visited physically. I know some of you visited virtually. 
because we've streamed it live in the past. We're not streaming it this year. Uh, we're filming it, but we're not streaming it. Um, I'll release more details in, in a very, very soon. So but it's usually four or five presenters, one topic all day. They have to come up with at the end of their session what we call a so what. Here are the five things you can do in your business. So it's not completely theoretical. They have to say, you should try this, you should try this. We've done boutiques, we've done all sorts of stuff. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Questions, maybe if there are questions we can ask Paul as he's trying to eat his lunch. <laughs> I'll stay in here. I'll stay in here. Elaine, what do we want to say for?